up guys, Otterpop here, and back with some more forensic content and hoping that third time's a charm because this is actually the third time that I have recorded this video. It's been a lovely blast. Okay, so, brief synopsis. A patron recently requested that I continue my sort of CSI criticism series. I only did about the first 11 minutes of CSI Season 2, Episode 1, and they were like, oh, no, give us some more forensic content. So here I am giving some more forensic content. And basically the first 11 minutes of the episode was... Most of it was pretty much at the crime scene or doing an autopsy or something along those lines. So I'm going to be looking at the next 11 minutes. And yes, I have already done this twice, but this is less a reaction and more criticism and an analysis of what's going on in this episode. So who cares how many times I have to record it? But dang it, I'm going to get this thing recorded. So I'm going to go ahead and do this. For any of you who are curious, the first time around the camera audio was absolute shout. It was very scratchy and there was no way to fix it. The second time around, I didn't even record at all. I thought I did. Didn't actually hit the record. And I was really mad. <laughs> so here's to hoping. Third time's the charm. <laughs> Now again, for those of you not familiar with some of my content, I graduated with a bachelor's degree in forensic science in 2018. I actually studied this particular kind of subject in college for four years. Basically, I'm going to be looking at sections of CSI episodes and basically criticizing and analyzing various aspects of each episode that I'm looking at, mostly the forensic elements, a little bit of the legal elements, and keep in mind too that when I say forensic science, I kind of more need the crime scene investigation side of it, less the forensic biochemistry and lab portion of it, because there were two routes that I could choose. I could choose the field route or the lab route. I went with the field route. So basically, crime scenes and photography, bloodstains, taphonomy, entomology, stuff like that, that is my jam. Lab stuff, such as gas chromatography and, you know, toxicology, blood work, blood panels, um, even a little bit the autopsies and some anatomy as well. I'm not as familiar with that because I wasn't trained in that. <laughs> trained, educated, trained, educated, regardless. So. I do have certain areas of expertise, I have certain areas where I am not quite as knowledgeable, and I don't necessarily have any professional experience. My critiques and analysis are simply based off of what I've learned in my education system, based on the mock work that I've done in said education system. We did a lot of mock uh, crime scenes, we did a mock trial at one point, and we've just, we've done a lot of hands-on work. So it's, it's much more ingrained in me overall. So. Let's go ahead. Let's get on with this, shall we? Catherine Willows is here to see him. Catherine, I gotta remember that name. Real quick, pause a moment. I was initially watching this particular segment of this episode for the first time, and I'm like, that guy looks super familiar. It didn't take me until my second time watching that I realized, oh, it's, um, crap, I've already forgotten his name. Herschel. Herschel from The Walking Dead. That's how I know this guy. <laughs> The first time I saw you. That was a long time ago. You were married, and I was a baby. It would have never worked. Even when Tony was juicy, he could run circles around these college Harvard types. And I'm not saying that just because he was my kid. Just between you and me, I couldn't hold a candle to him. Now he's dead. Sam, did you ever talk to Tony about any of his girlfriends? Janine Haywood. She's the worst, and he loved her the most. If I know her type, now that she has the gold, she'll be going after the silver. Okay, so... There was a pretty long-witted conversation right there, and I'm going to have to cut a whole bunch of it out. But basically, this woman, Catherine, was talking to this guy, Sam, about her son's death, who was the victim from the first portion of the episode. I'll go ahead and just link that right in the video or description, whichever. So basically, this Catherine individual, who I believe is also a CSI, is trying to get information out of the victim's father, talking about, you know, how the victim was good at running a casino and how he had a whole bunch of girlfriends and in including the one that was seen in the first portion of this an episode analysis as well. I have a big problem with this particular scene, mainly because of one reason. I'll get into that in just a moment, but first let me explain a little something. Based on the dialogue between Catherine and Sam, who is the father of the victim, Sam has known Catherine since she was a baby, which means that he and her families are somehow well connected. I don't know if they're related. They are either related or they are family friends in some capacity. And I have a problem with that regardless because of bias. Let me explain. 
you are basically talking about a crime scene investigator who is actively trying to do detective work and trying to gain information from family members or close relatives or whatnot of a crime scene victim. Why in the world would you do that? That is that is absolutely... I, I, I don't necessarily know if it's just if it's flat out a rule that you can't do that or if it's just common sense that you shouldn't do that. I mean, I feel like it could be a rule in some places and could depend on the certain agencies, but if you have a personal connection, especially like, you know, close friend or family member or relative, if you are a forensic tech and you have a close relationship with either the victim or the family of a victim or the close friends of the victim or anything of the sort, your ass should not be going out detectiving <laughs> and you you should stay as far away from the legal side of things as much as possible. That's the other thing too, is that Catherine is a CSI and she's doing police officer and detective work. CSIs do not, I repeat, do not do interrogations or investigations of this nature. They don't talk to witnesses or get testimonies or anything like that. We are simply objective observers. We look at the crime scene, we take all the information and put together some like the most likely scenario, regardless of, you know, who family or friends are and potential witnesses, the exact nature of the victim and the crime. Like we look at the scene objectively. We don't get to, we don't go into the human interaction portion of it because that's not our job. And I know I keep saying we and our, and I'm technically not a professional, I'm not in the field, but I cannot understate that anymore because it's very important. Because here's the thing, forensic science is defined as science applied to the law. We are not the law. We use knowledge and science and facts and apply that to the law. We work with the law or for the law. We are not the law. So we don't get into the human interaction aspect of what a lot of these CSIs seem to do in this particular show. That's not our job, not at all. And again, whether a family friend or a relative or anything like that, you definitely should not be talking to witnesses and getting testimony from potential sources because there's a personal bias that could probably result as a result of that. <laughs> By talking to witnesses, you see their emotions, you see their faces, you hear their words. Human emotion and body language is a very powerful thing. Some people are very good at deceiving and other people are, they're just very truthful and honest, but it doesn't matter because you talk to someone in that scenario and you are being swayed by them by the combination of their words, their tone, their body language, their facial expressions, whether slightly or in a major way, whether it's to your advantage or to their advantage, you talk to them in any capacity, your own opinions will be swayed and that will, that will unquestionably lead to personal bias. And we can't have that. We are objective observers. Objective, keyword. So, whatever Catherine was doing, totally not at all what she should be doing. She should not be doing that whatsoever. Okay. Fuming technique. Turn off the hot plate. Close, close the hood. 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 Oh my god, close the hood. Okay, so I do have some slight problems with this. Now, granted, this isn't necessary. This is kind of lab work, but this is also something I am a little bit familiar with because I was trained in fingerprint identification, classification, analysis, and comparison. So I am a little bit familiar with some of the fingerprint techniques. He was using a legitimate technique called the fuming method. Basically, you take uh, something like a super glue, like a cyanoacrylate, cyanoacrylate. I can't speak English right now. 
the glue will basically be superheated and release all kinds of gases and those gases are attracted to the various like amino acids and proteins and lipids that fingerprints leave behind on all different kinds of objects so it'll attach to them and then afterwards you use fingerprint powder to basically bring them up to the surface or i'm sorry the cyanoacrylate is to sort of attach to the fingerprints and bring them up to the surface and the fingerprint powder is to you know make them visible because most latent prints are going to be invisible to the naked eye. I know I've talked a little bit more about fingerprints, especially when it comes to latent and patent fingerprints. Um, I'll go ahead and just link that video as well, because again, I know that I've talked about that. So the technique he used was a viable one, but I still have some problems because the fuming method is not a super fast procedure. Granted, it can take, I think, if I'm recalling correctly, anywhere from like 15 to 30 minutes. It doesn't happen in a matter of seconds. I'm sorry, it doesn't. Also, this is actually something I'm a little bit more on the unsure side of, because he had the hot plate, he had the aluminum tin, and then afterwards, after letting the tin heat up for a little bit, then he puts the glue on there, which starts heat, which starts becoming gaseous immediately. I don't actually know for sure if that's the correct method to do that. I don't know for sure if you put the glue in a tin, put on a hot plate, then close it, or if you did it the way that he did it. I feel like it makes a little more sense to put it on the hot plate, put the glue in, and then turn the hot plate on. I think it makes less sense to turn the hot plate on, let it run for a little bit, and then put the glue on, because those, those gases, like the cyanoacrylate gases, you don't want to breathe those in. Because if you breathe enough of that, of that gaseous form of cyanoacrylate, it can cause some respiratory problems. So I feel like the way that he did it was technically not correct. I may be also sure on what I was saying earlier because <laughs> when he opened it back up and took out the tube again, he just left the pu the, the, the hood open. Why? Why would you do that? He didn't just leave it open as well. He left the glue on the hot plate burning. He should have at least turned the hot plate off. Or maybe he should have, you know, opened up the hood slightly, turned it off, closed it, waited a few more moments until there were fewer gases, and then take out the object of analysis. So technically what he did is a legitimate method, but it was exaggerated both on the time front and he also did not do it in the correct way. I am almost completely certain on that. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. That's, that's something I almost forgot to mention as well. No way you get that many clear, big-ass prints on a single little bottle. Here, let, let me give you an example. You see, you see it, you see the phone? You see me touching it all over the place? Yeah, there are all kinds of fingerprints. They are likely going to be partials, or they're going to be smudges, or they're going to be overlaid by all different kinds of other prints. I would need to wipe this clean and place my fingers on the phone for a good few seconds and just leave it still and then take it off and then very carefully set it down so that I can actually see some of the fingerprints that are still there. No way do you get that many clear prints. I've worked enough with fingerprints to know that at the best for a little bottle like that you might get a couple of partials and maybe you're lucky to get a nice clear full print. But no way in heck are you going to get that many large, clear, vivid prints on that tiny, tiny little bottle. Sorry. No. I took six prints off this bottle. Yeah. Six. They all belong to one person. It's good if you're us. Bad if you're Janine Haywood. All right. Here's something else a little bit interesting. I have never actually seen how IAFIS works. Um, IAFIS is the Integrated Automatic Fingerprint Identification System. I had to think about that for a moment. But basically how IAFIS works is that it has a whole bunch of prints stored and there's some kind of analysis function on it, I believe. Again, I've only ever heard of it. I've never actually seen it work. But here's something also interesting as well. IAFIS doesn't automatically have everybody's prints in the system. Now granted, they had Janine's prints or whatever, but that's because they took them from the house in the first part of the episode that I was analyzing. But fun fact for basically everybody else, most of the time the only prints that are actually going to be in IAFIS are prints related to law enforcement. So, you know, police officers, lawyers, forensic techs, federal agents, 
as well as anybody who was incarcerated, whether for a short period of time or a long period of time, whether they're in prison or jail. You're not really going to find a lot of other kinds of prints that are going to be in IAFIS. The database is actually incredibly small. That said, CSIs can find prints on scenes, they can gather prints later and compare them and then just, you know, sort of match them that way. Speaking of comparing and matching, this is also something that I've talked about in that other fingerprint video that I did mention earlier. There are three primary levels of detail that you are comparing for when you are analyzing multiple, two or more fingerprints at least. There's level one detail, which is basically the generic type of print, and there are really only three that everybody knows about, the arch, the loop, and the whorl. Second level detail is where it gets interesting, because second level detail is specific markings within fingerprints and within ridges. So ridge endings, islands, enclosures, bifurcations, things along those lines. I'll go ahead and just uh, pop a little image because I, I know I've used it somewhere before. Then there's level three detail, which is ridge flow and basically the combination of of all the level 2 details, how they all come together. Analyzing level 2 detail and level 3 detail of fingerprints is crucial when you're comparing any kinds of fingerprints, or if you're comparing four unknown prints to six sets of known prints. And the thing too is that there really is no good standard for how many of those specific markings you need to match in order for anybody to say, this fingerprint belongs to this individual. And even then, we don't say, you know, this fingerprint absolutely belongs to this individual. We say, most likely, this fingerprint came from this source, or there is a possibility that this fingerprint came from this source. That is how we phrase that. Because technically speaking, we are never certain on anything. We really shouldn't be. Even if you look at DNA tests, like, we can still be like 99.99% sure that this blood sample came from this source, but we can never say, absolutely, this is what happened, for sure, certainly. <laughs> we don't really use terms like that when, you know, talking about evidence and sort of relaying it to juries and whatnot. There, there, there are some rules and limitations. But again, in terms of matching even one fingerprint with another one, there really is no good number for how many of those markings have to match. I mean, I've found three or four matching markings between fingerprints, and I've found as many as 12, and even that seemed like a lot to me. There really is no standard, but obviously the more the better. Now, I'm probably going to stop there because otherwise I might get into a little bit more of a rant about fingerprints because that actually it actually is something I'm very familiar with but I talk more about it in a different video I know that for a fact so go ahead and check that out because it'll probably have a bunch more information well, I don't know about a bunch more but it will have some more information regarding fingerprints and analysis and comparison so go ahead and do that what's the matter with your leg I don't know man something back at that house must have bitten me let me see the bite chigger bite Probably picked it up walking through the ferns in Braun's backyard. So funny enough, when I was first watching this little segment of the episode, I didn't even know what he said, but it wasn't until the second time where I realized, oh, he said chigger, which I actually am a little bit familiar with. Chigger is basically a kind of mite, which is itself a kind of arachnid, you know, also alongside spiders and scorpions. But chigger mite bites are actually, I wouldn't necessarily say unique, but they can be a little bit identifiable. So the fact that he was able to look at it and determine, oh, it's just a chigger bite, yeah, I mean, that actually seems very plausible. It could be mistaken for bites of, you know, potentially some other arachnids and potentially some insects as well, but yeah. All I mostly know is that trigger bites can be a little bit uncomfortable and itchy, but they're pretty harmless to humans and they will largely go away on their own. As long as you don't keep scratching it. <laughs> well, that doggy door. Something definitely two-legged went through it. Got mostly partials. Print lab's working on it now. Be sure to check it against Janine Haywood's prints. Braun's stomach contents. No food. Plenty of drugs. Xanax and heroin. Where are all the undissolved pills? Didn't find any. My guess someone mashed up the Xanax, dissolved them in red wine, which I did find. Wouldn't have taken much to bind his hands with duct tape. It wasn't 100 pills. Educated, unofficial guess. No more than 50. Can you actually give a good unofficial, uneducated guess as to how many pills were dissolved in a man's stomach contents. This is again kind of in the area where I'm not necessarily as familiar with because this falls a little bit more towards the lab portion. But 
that, that is true. Dig digestion normally for kind of anything that we eat or drink can take anywhere between, I want to say, 6 to 12 hours. And his and the victim's body was relatively fresh by the time it was found, meaning that he could not have died very long before the body was found. There were even any signs of decomposition. I mean, not that I saw. So I don't actually know about the possibility of being able to make a sort of uneducated guess as to how many pills he had, even if they were, whether they were crushed up or not. It could be possible, but is it really possible to have 50 in your system? Seriously? I don't know, it just seems like a little bit of a high number to me, but this this is where my knowledge starts to drop just a slight bit. I'm, I'm actually not very sure. I lost a customer. It's like losing my job, kind of. Your bronze grocery store. So when did you last deliver? The night before he croaked. I dropped off some balloons. 30 Xanadus. Xanax. Um, okay, uh, once again, I said it once before, and I will say it again. CSIs don't interrogate. They don't go into the world and interrogate. And if anything, that guy should have been brought into the police station to be questioned. But instead, some of the CSIs were doing that. No. No, 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 no. That's not how that works. And then a back alley at night? Why? It's like you're freaking ringing a dinner bell. Hey, I'm somebody who works with for whatever law enforcement, and I'm interrogating this known drug dealer or what not. Come and kill me. Seriously, that's, that's how it comes across to me anyways. I took two, gave Tony two, and I accidentally dropped 15 or 20 down the sink. The fingerprints all over the prescription bottle. I went to the pharmacy, picked up the prescription, signed for it, brought it back to the house. Ah, third time's a charm. CSIs do not interrogate or question potential witnesses or perpetrators. This is not our job. Law enforcement is usually a little bit more sly. They don't necessarily bring half-baked baked evidence and suspicions to a potential suspect. It's like grade school mistake. At least for, you know, say a seasoned veteran of forensics or police officer or something like that. But no. No, 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 no. And kind of another question now that I think about it. I didn't consider it in the previous two instances that I watched this. But can she legally pick up his prescription and his medical prescription and sign for it? Is there a way you can do that based on, you know, the certain clinic or pharmacy, sorry, pharmacy that's, that prescribes you certain medications or with certain insurances? Like, can you actually legally do that? Because I actually don't know for sure. You might be able to, but pff, what the heck do I know? It's been 24 minutes, Greg. When's this thing gonna be done? It's bronze blood, and with all the impurities in his system, it might take a little extra time. Excuse me. I love how, as soon as this uh, senior guy mentions, uh, hey, it, it's been a while, what are the results coming? And boom, results are coming. <laughs> this is, again, where my knowledge comes into, I wouldn't say question, but where I'm a little bit less knowledgeable. But in terms of separating impurities from blood, this lab guy could be talking about a centrifuge, is what he's using to separate the blood from the impurities of the heroin and the Xanax and whatnot. So, and I don't necessarily know for sure, but 24 minutes seems like a little bit too short of a time. I feel like for a centrifuge, like with that size, with however much blood, depending on how many impurities there are, I would imagine it'd take a little bit more like a couple of hours as opposed to 20 minutes. Also, something I did not notice in my previous two watches of this particular episode segment was the evidence bag that this guy is actually carrying right now. So, the label and the red tape across it actually seems like legitimate, like, like it's a legitimate evidence bag. Take note, that's actually what a legitimate evidence bag looks like. Yes, they can sometimes be paper bags, it depends on the item that was obtained and the material that the item is comprised of. Certain items can, get, can go into paper bags without too much of an issue and they won't get contaminated, so there is that. And what's also interesting is that label does look like a legitimate evidence label. I've written on enough of them, and yes, I've actually written on actual evidence bags. I've dealt with real evidence bags in the past. I've said earlier, I've worked at a few mock crime scenes where we had to take all kinds of measurements, take all kinds of photographs, have specific details, and 
work with you know real tools including evidence bags and the tape that is over this evidence bag is also it, it looks a lot like the tape that i used whenever i was using bags like these in my college classes and that tape is really good for you know keeping any evidence bags together but it's actually a lot more fragile than people think it is it's easy to tell if that tape has been tampered with and it's so important to take note of when those bags were open when they were sealed up when they were sealed up again, when they were used or tested for any reason whatsoever. There is a very specific and delicate process when it comes to evidence. You know, heroin has a nine minute half-life. After that, it metabolizes into morphine. What's the six mam count? 158 nanograms per mil. Definitely not lethal. The same with your Xanax. Quarter mil tabs, 100 micrograms per liter. Again, not lethal. Okay, so this guy mentioned that heroin has a half-life of nine minutes, which means that he's probably talking about something similar to what I'm familiar with known as radioactive decay. I don't necessarily know as much when it comes to drugs, but my guess is that the half-life of certain medications or drugs is basically the amount of time that passes when half of the original quantity of the medication or drug has been absorbed or exited the system in some way. So basically when half of it, half of the original material has been used up is my guess of what a half-life of a drug is, which means that it would take nine minutes for half of the heroin to be absorbed by the body or flushed out by the body or something like that. It would take another nine minutes for a quarter of that. So basically 75% of it is gone after 18 minutes. And then after another nine minutes, then it would be an eighth. So now it's closer to about 87% of the original heroin content has been absorbed or used up by the body system um, after like 27 minutes and so on and so forth. It just keeps dividing in half further and further. At least that's my guess of what he means when he says, you know, the half-life and ba based on the times of it. I'm not actually sure what the half-life of heroin or most drugs is. Because I'm trying to think about, you know, some of the over-counter stuff that maybe I would take for a headache or a cold or something like that. Because you normally get a little bottle of over-the-counter stuff and it says one or two pills every like four to six hours. I imagine that some of those drugs might have a slightly longer half-life. I'm not entirely sure. So I'm curious to know if the half-life of heroin being nine minutes, if that necessarily means anything. And if that's actually true, I, I feel like that could be semi-accurate. If, if maybe not a slight bit off. I'm not, again, not for sure on that. But it's also interesting that he apparently had a whole bunch of heroin in his system and a whole bunch of Xanax in his system. And somehow it wasn't lethal. I mean, there was a lot of it that hadn't been digested yet. So maybe that could be a big part of it. Maybe that's why it wasn't lethal. It wasn't lethal yet. It wasn't lethal yet or it wasn't lethal, period. Which I find a little hard to believe if you're just going to down 50 Xanax all of a sudden. With heroin in your system. And by the way, heroin mixed with any alcohol and or over-the-counter medication or legitimate medication has to be one of the worst combos. I don't know enough about heroin, thankfully. But I can only imagine that, like, say, the combination of alcohol in the form of wine, heroin, and Xanax would be a nasty combination. I don't know for sure, but I feel like it should be if it's not. It is almost the 22 minute mark, so I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to stop right here, because <laughs> I've been talking for quite a while already. My voice, I can already feel it in my voice and my throat just a slight bit. I've been talking for so much. So long. Whoops. So a few points that I kind of want to summarize regarding to what I've been talking about for this entire episode. One is to be careful of personal bias. If you can avoid it at all costs, please do so. I've talked enough about personal bias near the beginning of this video, so I don't think I need to talk about it too much more. Number two, CSIs are not detectives or police officers. We are objective observers. We do not do the interrogations or the questioning. Three, the fuming method and IAFIS are legitimate in terms of forensic science and forensic methods. They are definitely exaggerated here and one of the big issues that I was having was safety. <laughs> Number four, please do not mix medications, drugs, and alcohol. And 
might want to brush up a little bit on your science of how you can estimate how much how much crushed up Xanax is in a man's stomach. To be fair, I don't necessarily know how accurate that last point was. I just, I, I, I have to question everything in this show. And finally, number five. Chiggers are little bastards. 